I remember when I was a kid, around 12 or so. I was at some music store that just happened to have a small game corner. I browsed through the different games as my mom looked for a Sheryl Crow album, and as I did so, I came across the first Devil May Cry. I'd heard about it both from Game Informer and from a couple friends. Why my mom bought me an M-rated gory game about demons at such a young age, I'll never know or be able to thank her enough. I'd never played anything like Devil May Cry before, mainly because there simply was nothing else like it at the time. Between 2001 and 2005, if you wanted to play a game like DMC, your choices were DMC. And maybe Beautiful Joe if you were more concerned with DMC's focus on style and high skill cap gameplay than its gothic atmosphere and 3D brawling. To this day though, I can clearly remember staying up well past midnight slaying demons in the most stylish ways I could figure out. I think it may very well have been the first game I played where I made a serious concentrated effort to get better at it. It was the first game that I ever played where I would practice bosses. It was the first game I ever attempted to, well, master. And I remember how happy I was the first time I beat the game without dying once, and defeated Phantom with an S rank after staying up so late that it probably would have been easier to just go to sleep and just play the fight fresh in the morning. Knowing what I know now, that the game's director, Hideki Kamiya, used to also stay up well into the evening attempting no-death runs of Castlevania, Fantasy Zone, and Xanic. I think he would be proud knowing that he gave another kid the same experience. Hideki Kamiya was born in 1970 in the somewhat rural Nagano prefecture in Japan. In his early days, he was attracted to the digital beeps and boops of various arcade games like a moth to a flame. However, coming from a strict family that was more interested in grades than games, he was denied access to a console of his own. Not to be dissuaded, however, he did his best to play games where he could, frequently walking down to the video game section of his local department store to use their demo stand. At one point, Kamiya went as far as to befriend the neighborhood boy, enduring the physical abuse that came along with it, simply to get access to the boy's epoch cassette vision. Kamiya once said, when faced with the choice of staying home without being bullied or playing Epoch Cassette Vision, the game console was the clear winner. Every time I'd come home having been punched, but I'd go again the next day. Whether games had forced their way into his life or vice versa, they were here to stay. While in his second year of junior high, Hideki managed to finally gain permission from his parents to buy an NES, though with a catch. You see, this was at the height of the NES sales boom in Japan. They were nowhere to be found, try as you might. However, come New Year's Eve, that same department store where he would play games as a kid announced they would be selling 10 NESs to the first 10 people in line at opening. So at 4 in the morning, a young Kamiya threw on his coat and rushed out of the house at full speed to get in line, only to discover that the line had long since surpassed 10 people. Being from such a small town, the possibility had never occurred to him, but here he was. There's nothing he could do. He dragged himself back home. Don't worry though, he managed to get an NES within the week from a friend of his cousin's. Things work out that way sometimes. As he continued to spend his youth in arcades and playing his friend's master systems, Sharp X 68000s, MSX, and so on, he found himself submerged further into gaming culture. It wasn't until he read a conversation between Mario and Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto and Xerveus creator Masunobu Endo in Famicom Magazine that it finally occurred to him that there were people making these games. He knew it was what he wanted to do, even if he had no clue how to do it. So, after using the personal computer he bought to learn how to code primarily as a gaming rig, failing his high school entrance exams, and spending a massive amount of time playing Gradius at his local batting cages, Hideki Kamiya finally graduated from college. Or, at least, I think he did. He first attempted to apply to Nintendo by submitting drawn project proposals in an attempt to get hired as a planner. However, after calling their HR department, he discovered that they unfortunately weren't hiring planners at the time. Namco, meanwhile, seemed more interested in his art design rather than his game design. Unfortunately, he had a little interest in doing art and ultimately turned the offer down. Finally, he found his home at Capcom. 
Now, Kamiya initially didn't have the highest opinion of Capcom. He felt they were stuck in a realm of 2D games in a world that was destined to become polygonal. However, during orientation, he was shown a game titled, at the time, as 3D Horror. Knowing the team needed people who could storyboard, he submitted his drawn design proposals. And so it was that Hideki Kamiya found himself working as a planner on the original Resident Evil under Shinji Mikami. Resident Evil's production was special, and not for the reasons you necessarily think. Now I'm here to talk about Hideki Kamiya, but here it gets hard to talk about Hideki Kamiya without talking about Shinji Mikami, because for all intents and purposes, Kamiya was Shinji Mikami's protege, which is important because nobody prior to Mikami directed the way he did at Capcom. As Kamiya put it, Mikami-san was the first one at Capcom who created the style of team on which the director is responsible for the core of the game. Until then, Capcom's company atmosphere had been one of everyone making games together, and it still was when I first joined. So there was a backlash and shock from giving the director absolute authority, and I was often against it too. For example, the staff on the ground level took it for granted that we would need to ramp up the action and would complain to the director how we were frustrated by, for example, not being able to have the player character move faster. The director, however, would say that the theme of the game was fear, so it should be left as is and refuse it. And when I played the final complete version of the game, I could see why Mikami-san hadn't budged. Kamiya would never fully adopt Mikami's somewhat totalitarian approach, but he quickly discovered its merits as he was granted his first directorial job at the reins of Resident Evil 2. You see, what you might not guess about Kamiya is that he's someone who is very eager to take on his team's advice and requests, a trait that would come to aid him greatly in his later career, but in his young, inexperienced position, caused him to okay everything that came up in development. The result was that a year and a half into development, the original version of Resident Evil 2 was completely scrapped because, according to all the sources, the game was an irredeemable mess, being dubiously named Resident Evil 1.5. Kamiya was humiliated, and for a time, was sure he was going to be fired. However, Mikami opted to keep him on as a director, a move Kamiya would later credit for giving him the career he has today. Thankfully, though, this move would prove to be the right call, and not just for Kamiya himself. Resident Evil 2 released in early 1998 to outstanding reviews and explosive sales. Following the success of Resident Evil 2, Kamiya had redeemed himself, not only in the eyes of Mikami and Capcom, but his own. Before long, he found himself at the helm of Resident Evil 4 at the behest of Shinji Mikami, and once again at the helm of not only another trouble production, but also a game development allegory for the theory of entropy. You see, the story of Resident Evil 4's development is absolutely insane, but I have to keep this restraint to just Kamiya. But this is basically what happened. Having been able to wrangle a bit more creative freedom due to his success with Resident Evil 2, Kamiya set out to make RE4 a cool and stylish action game. This might sound odd, but let's not forget what Resident Evil 4 would eventually become. Anyways, Kamiya and his team continued to tweak the Resident Evil formula little by little, first by having a super-powered protagonist, then by abandoning the original static camera system from the former Resident Evil games, followed finally by moving the game's setting to Europe, giving the protagonist a sword, two guns, and turning coolness into a mechanic. Before long, what they had in front of them was many things, but Resident Evil wasn't one of them. It was Resident Evil 1.5 all over again, but with one serious catch. This game was actually good. Mikami, seeing a problem if it remained as a Resident Evil game, but potential in the work itself, convinced Kamiya and his team to go independent with it and create a new IP. A game that was hard, bombastic, and most of all, fun. Devil May Cry was born. The first true Kamiya game. A game that undebatably shares his DNA first and foremost. Before long, he found himself working at the newly independent yet still Capcom-funded Clover Studio. It was here he would channel his love for classic tokusatsu films into Beautiful Joe before trying to recapture the natural feel of his mountainous hometown in Okami. These games were massively popular with critics, but struggled to find an audience, especially in Kamiya's native Japan. 
In addition, despite being set up by Capcom for the purpose of creating new IPs, Capcom was very reluctant to let them develop new IPs, infamously having a rule where 70-80% to 80 of all projects had to be sequels, though the actual number was usually closer to 100% at any given time. These shackles proved to be too much, not only for Kamiya, but Mikami, Clover CEO Atsushi Inaba, and the majority of the Clover team as well. Clover Studios was officially shut down in March of 2007, much to the dismay of fans and press alike, but unbeknownst to many of them, the majority of the team had already left and founded a new company. A company that would let Kamiya and everyone else at Clover finally pursue their creativity, untethered by Capcom. Platinum Games was founded in 2006, but it wasn't until 2009 that they released their first three games. Mad World, Infinite Space, and finally, the Hideki Kamiya directed Bayonetta. To call it a return to form would imply he ever truly lost his form, but for Devil May Cry fans who knew Kamiya's name, this was the game they'd been waiting for. And for those who didn't know his name, this seemed to be what brought his name to many of them. Prior to Bayonetta, most reviews for Beautiful Joe and Okami failed to mention Kamiya's name. However, with Bayonetta, many critics seemed to invoke his name in order to draw comparisons between it and Devil May Cry 1. I know this is how I first came across his name. In addition, a couple months after Bayonetta's release was when Kamiya created his now infamous uh, Twitter account. Oh boy. Finally, we come to Wonderful 101, which feels like a Kamiya fan game in the best way possible. You have characters that all look and act like his iconic protagonists, as well as the actual inclusion of two of them. Mechanics reminiscent of literally all of his games, from DMC's comboing, to Beautiful Joe's brawling, to Akami's drawing, to Bayonetta's parrying, and even a playable appearance by the man himself that grants you major strength, but will cause you to lose in one hit because he demands perfection. Everything is here with much, much more added. The only thing that holds this game back at all is since there is so much here that it becomes a bit of a dense text on a gameplay level. But as with any great dense text, you are exponentially rewarded for investing your time with it. And in a way, that's really close to being Kamiya's defining trait. As I mentioned earlier, Kamiya spent his childhood mastering the games at his disposal. In addition, having spent so much time in the arcades, he always wanted to get the most out of each individual credit, but would always want to show off how good he was for the people watching him play. All of this resulted in him crafting games designed above all else to be mastered. While the level of depth presented in each of his games may vary, every one of his games still manages to have mechanical complexity in spades. Even with the Zelda-inspired Okami, Kamiya still saw fit to put in a solid combo system complete with launches, charge attacks, and parries. And this is to say nothing of Bayonetta and Wonderful 101's near boundless depth. These mechanics aren't here for the layman, but for people eager to invest their time and energy, just as he once did, to developing skilled, stylish play. However, Unlike many of his contemporaries, his goal isn't to encourage skillful play through placing the player in exceptionally challenging circumstances. He has stated in the past that he thinks his games are relatively easy. If you want to run through the game and play conservatively while constantly using healing items and continues, they very openly allow that. They might not reward it, but they never really punish it either. No, when Kamiya encourages his player to undertake skillful play, he does it in three ways. One. The ranking system, which rewards you with in-game currency for playing well, in addition to S ranks and peer platinum trophies. Two, his secret missions that frequently demand mastery of a more advanced technique such as jump cancelling or dodge offset to complete, but reward you with an incredibly valuable permanent health boost. And three, through the characters themselves. Kamiya is notable among action game directors in that, unlike many of them, he writes the scripts for his own games. And he uses this to set up what his characters, and by extension, what you are capable of during his gameplay. All of this ultimately engenders a desire to improve, if only for a chance to look half as cool as his protagonists do, all while he subtly hands you the tools to make your gameplay look that good. However, if mechanics were all his games had going for them, they wouldn't be as remarkable as they are. Thankfully, Kamiya is just as adept at cultivating tone and atmosphere as he is at crafting robust mechanics. 
To date, Kamiya's crafted two kinds of games. Colorful, lighthearted power fantasies starring a playful, brash protagonist, and dark, tense power fantasies starring a playful, brash protagonist. And despite these mirrored tones, they serve the same purpose due to the writing that encompasses them. They both make you feel as though you can do anything, be that because you're in a world where anything is possible, or a world where the odds are so stacked against you to the point where God and Satan want you to fail, yet you still wind up on top because you are just that damned good. His protagonists follow this pattern. Kamiya stated in the past that he never tried to make his characters cool, but instead to make them fun. It just so happens that it came out as cool. He's also admitted to admiring how the protagonist of Space Cobra seemed to always have a smirk on his face when he was fighting. When things got serious, the look would shift from playful to determined and things would get really tense for a minute. However, no matter what, each fight would end with a smirk and a quip because as nervous as the protagonist may have actually been, they always knew in their heart of hearts they could do it. Things may become tense, you may be defeated both in the narrative and the gameplay itself, but there's still nothing you can't do if you don't give up. This brings me to my favorite aspect of his games. His mechanics are amazing and clean, his tone and musical choices are always flawless, and his characters and writing are always brimming with charisma, but all of this is auxiliary to what makes his work great for me. Hideki Kamiya has a pure and unapologetic admiration for humanity and what it's capable of. All of Kamiya's protagonists are first and foremost human, save the one that operates in the best interests of humanity as a whole. He has gone on record saying that what makes Dante powerful isn't his demonhood, but his humanity. In fact, Kamiya has stated that Dante is snarky not because he's confident, but because he's afraid, because of course he is, demons are terrifying, but he knows what he needs to do and he won't be stopped and he will be damned if he lets them know his true feelings. So he throws on a smirk, throws out a jibe, and gets to work. Most of all, however, we see this in the mechanics. His games are constantly asking more of you to do it better than you did it last time, to do it faster than you did it without making a single mistake and it knows you can do it because he could do it. Hideki Kamiya has been on the other side of that screen, playing through Gradius 2, palms sweating as he frantically tries to avoid the legs of that final mechanical spider in his path, just as I and perhaps even you have as we sat, terrified that the next swipe of Jubilees' hand will be the one that takes our hard-earned pure platinum trophy from us. But as impossible as it seemed at first, I can say I have earned that trophy. And if I can do that, who's to say what I can't do? Perhaps that was his point all along. These games were never meant to be easy to master, but they can be mastered. No matter how difficult it might seem, you can do it. Because you are so much better than you think you are, and Hideki Kamiya knows it. As I did research for this, among all of the material I combed through, I think the most interesting thing I found was a complete playthrough of Bayonetta he did for a video podcast. It's great and fascinating in its own right, as it always is to see someone play a game they worked on, but that's not what stood out to me. Instead, what shocked me was just how incredibly humble and thankful he was. That probably sounds ruder than I mean it to, but what I mean is, for a man who's renowned for making these bombastic, over-the-top games while maintaining this incredibly abrasive Twitter persona combined with this kind of biker attitude, I was expecting a little bit of, well, brashness. Instead, I was greeted by a man who eagerly handed out credit to his team, who made it no secret that he eagerly took suggestions from everyone on that team and, most of all, was deeply grateful for the people who love his games, but lamented that more people didn't feel that way. A part that drove this home for me was a specific moment during his playthrough. He reminisced, I'm fortunate enough to have a few passionate fans among the Western gaming media. They'll come to me and tell me, Joe was awesome, Okami was awesome, 
and they'll even hand me copies to sign before interviews, which is great. And then he paused for a moment, taking a beat, before saying, Games that appeal to that crowd don't really sell, do they? And that's the only type of game I know how to make. I don't actually think he's sad or melancholic or anything like that. Most places I've seen him, he's seemed generally proud of both himself and his team. But I want you to remember this. Come 2017, when you're playing Scalebound for the first time, I want you to not just think of the man who blocks people on Twitter and gives you the thumbs up. I want you to think of the man and his team working tirelessly to make the game as perfect as it can be. I want you to think of the man who was hopeful that his unborn daughter would enjoy his games, and that his FPS playing brother would enjoy Angel Attack. I want you to think of the man who led Resident Evil to near destruction before leading it to complete glory. Most of all, I want you to think of the boy, sitting in front of the blue glow of his CRT TV, late into the night as he ignores his junior high studies, while he pursued perfection in Punch-Out and Simon's Quest who would one day give other children the same experience. I want you to think of Hideki Kamiya.